Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. Day today is the 1st of April, year of our Lord 2024. Welcome to yet another edition of The Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Inkle, a.k.a. Motown Noah. Gonna let you guys know right off the bat, right off the rip, I'm a grown man. I'm an adult. There are no April Fool's jokes to be had here. This is a safe space for the next, you know, 45 to 60 minutes. I'm not gonna get any goofs off on you guys. I don't do that anymore. The irony is that I did kind of have a plan to do a bit for the entirety of this show, and then A, realized it was April Fool's Day, and was like, no, no, next, maybe a different week. And then B, was like, this just isn't going to play very well. So I learned something about myself over the weekend, and then that is apparently that I dream in performance. I dream in podcasting. Because I had a dream that I did an entire 60-minute show in a transatlantic accent. And I thought to myself, that's funny. That's a good bit. And I was like, why don't I give that a shot? I got about three minutes into it before I was like, this is, this is, people are going to get three minutes into it. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. The day today is the 1st of April, year of our Lord 2024. Welcome to yet another edition of The Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Inkle, a.k.a. Motown Noah. You get three to five minutes into that. It's all right, next, we get what you're doing, we get the bit. Like, can you please just go back to talking normal? It just wasn't that funny. It was not funny enough. And then I was like, what are, what are some other accents that I could do? And I was like, how about I just talk? How about I just do the damn show the way that I'm supposed to do the show? So that's what we're going to do today. And my gift to you guys, because I don't know if you've seen this and I don't know if you've heard about this. Oh, I guess I'm recording this a day early for no reason other than I just wanted to. I just had the itch to, to, I don't know, sit down and talk for a little bit. So I'm going to. Today's Easter, or as of the day that you're listening, that Sunday was Easter? Had no idea. Had no idea until about noon. My girlfriend goes into work. She's like, hey, she's like, I got to work really fast. There's like no traffic. I was like, huh, that's weird. She goes, oh, it's Easter. Oh, I had no idea. So happy late Easter to everybody out there. Is Ramadan still going on? You guys fasting? Don't break your fast. Don't break your fast. Better NBA player. Untucked Kyrie or Ramadan Kyrie? Has anybody have that had that discussion yet? Has anybody uh, delved into the stats on that one? Although it would be difficult with untucked Kyrie because there's not, they don't track that. With Ramadan Kyrie, that would be easy to sort of look into. But untucked, you wouldn't really be able to do that. So for all intents and purposes, recency bias, we're going to go with Ramadan Kyrie is the greatest iteration of a player. Last week, we talked about like March, Jalen Green, Hoodie Mellow, Game 6 Clay, all this stuff, untucked Kyrie. We did not, We it was a glaring omission of Ramadan Kyrie. So we're going to throw him in there. I think my April Fool's Day, not a uh, goof that I'm going to pull over on you guys, but my gift to you guys, rather, is going to be for this episode exclusively... No intrusive thoughts by me and no tangents, no tangents. And if there are, there'll be marginal ones that are related that we can easily circle back to what we were supposed to originally be talking about. So for a tight 45 to 60 today, we're going to stick to the meat and potatoes of this episode. And for the first uh, portion, for the front nine of today's episode, I wanted to talk about some teams that I've enjoyed watching this season in a way that I kind of didn't expect. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, wow, I really enjoyed watching Milwaukee this year. Shocker. That's like my whole deal. That's like what I do, right? I want to start with Dallas because even though I went into the year knowing how I felt about them, knowing how I felt about Jason Kidd being a bad coach, knowing how I felt about Luka being one of the greatest players I've literally ever seen play in my life, there's something to be said about the way that they've captivated me. And I think as of this recording, they're on a six-game winning streak, heading into the playoffs on a hot streak sort of the inverse of what the Clippers have been doing, kind of this uh, collapse. Kind of weird that you watch the Clippers on... Nope, this is a tangent. This is a tangent. So the Dallas Mavericks, here's why I like them so much. Because I don't know if there's a backcourt in the... I'm not going to do the whole thing. Is this the best backcourt in the NBA? I don't give a shit about that. But it's definitely a backcourt that I enjoy watching more than anybody else between Luka and Kyrie. And an, a mental exercise that I was doing the other night when it was uh, the, the Kings and the Mavs were playing is you see Luka and Kyrie participate in this my turn, your turn, you know, style of play from time to time. And I think the closest iteration to that is what we have in Boston with the Jays. You know, every other possession, it's like, this is Jalen, then it's Jason, then it's Jalen, then it's Jalen, then it's Jalen, then maybe it's Jalen again, and then it's going to be Tatum. 
Why does it work? Why does it feel like it works better in in, Bo- in I'm sorry in Dallas with Luca and Kyrie? Why does it feel like they have it more coordinated and it's it's almost like? And I'm just thinking about this on the fly because seriously, I didn't want to text anybody and then accidentally use somebody else's answer. I really wanted to try to think about this on the fly because I I didn't get very far. So I'd love to hear some of your guys' thoughts on this. Is for me, I think with Dallas, it almost feels like the whole my turn, your turn thing between Luka and Kyrie is always more calculated. And I think that they almost have a better barometer for when it's supposed to be their turn. Whereas in Boston, dog, they can have the best record in the NBA and they can be the best team in the NBA, but it still feels forced sometimes. Wasn't it Wasn't it the other night that Tatum, I think, was it against Atlanta? I don't remember who it was against. And he, he gets a shot off at the end of regulation. And there are two bodies on him. There are two hands in his face. And Missoula, at the end of the game, they were like, what about that shot? What the hell happened there? And Missoula was like, yeah, we got the ball out in space to our guy, JT. And he got off a good look. And then there's just a screenshot of two hands in his face pulling up from the wing. Huh? That was the shot? Okay. I don't mean, I, I feel like in the last few months, I've kind of turned into like the shot police. And every time there's a shot that I don't like, I very aggressively say, that was the shot? Really? That was the shot? But you can't help but have that sentiment a lot this season, especially in crunch time. What's weird is when you look at a guy like Luka and you look at a guy like Kyrie, you know, more often than not, they're putting shit up that you're, that's the shot, really? But the difference is it just always, it just inexplicably goes in because these are two of the most talented shot creators and shot makers in the NBA where they can take a super high percentage uh, or rather they can take super low percentage looks, but they just always go in inexplicably. And I apologize if I'm repeating myself from something that I said in the previous episode. I I don't remember if I said this or not, but I've developed a very annoying habit whenever I watch Dallas. It doesn't matter where Luka is on the floor. If he puts up a shot before it's in the air, Still, I don't even, you know, you can kind of do the mental trajectory on the, is that about to go in? That looks like it's a little bit offline. I will, under my breath, go, oh my God, every single time. Because it's usually from where he's shooting it, the angle that he's shooting it from, you know, maybe there's a body or two on him. It's always like, if this goes in, I'm just preemptively, oh my Godding it. You know what I mean? And I'm bearing the lead because as valuable as Luka will always be and as valuable as Kyrie has been to this team, and I, I do have one quick other spiel on Kyrie in a second, you look at a guy like Daniel Gafford. I can take or leave the P.J. Washington trade. It's worked on some nights and it hasn't worked on others. Has the Daniel Gafford trade just worked on every single night? And I don't know what it's what it's up to now, but it was like a week ago. If Gafford and Luka were starting together, so right, Luca's always going to start, but if, as long as Daniel Gafford was in the starting lineup, since the trade, they hadn't lost, huh? And then there was one game where Gafford started, but Luca was out, and they did end up, I believe, losing that game. But I think it was close, so that one doesn't really count. But between him and Derek Lively, it's almost like the same picture, just in terms of what they can do. Because I would say that Derek Lively is a better lob threat. But you just have these two dudes who just like perpetually patrol the paint. Nobody's going to get a shot off on them. And then you also had, I don't even think we, we, we covered it on this show, which is a damn shame because here at the Coping Hour, we cover all the biggest stories and we cover them from all angles. Daniel Gafford was, what, a field goal or two away from breaking Wilt's all time record for most consecutive field goals made? Huh? A record, by the way, that he set the franchise record, I believe, against Detroit, or he got close against Detroit, and then it was the next game that they played two nights later against Chicago that he actually got the record. And what I really appreciated about it is he wasn't just taking the easy shots around the rim. Most of them, if not all of them, were within like five to seven feet of the, I wouldn't even say seven, within five feet of the basket is what it seemed like. But they were always tough shots. They were always tough looks. Even the ones that were dunks, like there was a chance that they weren't going to go in. He didn't give a shit about the record. He just wanted to score. And he wanted to put his team in the position to win. And I think that's what Daniel Gafford has been doing. The the spiel that I wanted to, oh, 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 ooh, 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 dog. I've been wanting to say this for weeks, weeks about Dallas. I'm sure, you know, some big YouTuber out there has already covered this. But I cannot help but be shocked every time I watch the Mavericks. Because my takeaway always ends up being the same. Holy shit. 
Dante Exum has a career? Huh? Is that a testament to his work ethic? Or is it a testament to the floor raiser that is Luka Doncic? And I could sit here and say, it can't be both. It can't be both. It could absolutely be both. (laughs) Both of those things could absolutely be true. But I'm shocked and I'm appalled that on a nightly basis, Dante Exum is not only not a zero, but is actually a legitimate role player for those Mavericks. Like, we'll always knock down at least one big shot in every single game when the Mavericks needed it the most. You know, even if they were up by seven, it's like, well, you just put them up by double digits. Dante Exum is always there and arrives precisely when he needs to. He's Gandalf. He's literally Gandalf. Holy shit. Dante Exum is Gandalf. Except now he's like Dante Exum the blue because he's in Dallas. Holy shit. Thinking about this on the fly. Because I was trying to think of like what the equivalent would be. I'm like, what is who's another NBA player that would sort of be on the level of Dante Exum that I'm like, holy shit, this guy? It would have to be Emmanuel Moutier. If he was still, who knows where he is? Oh, I mean, is he still playing basketball anywhere? Or is he, did he, did he pivot and now he's doing the real estate thing? And now he's doing the insurance thing that like most retired athletes do. Who knows? I don't know where Emmanuel Moutier is. Hell, he could be in the G League, honestly. Dog, I just learned like three weeks ago that Norris Cole is still hooping in the G League. Huh? Is he not 100? Is he not a fossil at this point? Norris Cole? Good for him. Love the Mavs. Final thing on them. I, I I love Dallas's media. Shout out to Tim Cato. I love Dallas's media because they don't try to get quotes out of Kyrie. They don't bother him. They just let him exist, and they're there to talk about basketball. He's there to talk about basketball, and there's not this you know media frenzy surrounding him. Uh, I think some of it is maybe also a testament to him because I guess maybe part of the – not problem, but – part of what fed into the media frenzies in in Brooklyn for him, maybe even a little bit in Boston, but at this point it was, what, six years ago. I don't remember it too well. Not quite that. Well, I guess he went there like six years ago. I digress. And he would just like post shit on his Instagram. And he was like, all right, okay, all right, all right. My recommendation for anybody of any notoriety at all would just to be to live privately. Maybe that. Yeah, I mean, hey, what do I know? But I love the Mavericks. I love Kyrie. I love Luka. And the fact that both of those dudes can coexist in the way that they do and can share the floor the way that they do uh, is huge. And I'm really excited to see where they go. There's a chance I'd have to pull up the standings. I know there's a a small chance, maybe a little bit bigger than small, that they play the Clippers in round one. They don't want that. The Clippers, I should say. They do not want that. The Mavericks are the team that... God forbid anybody has to play them in the first round. And there is a there is a reality where it shakes out that Dallas ends up getting Denver. Round one. Damn. That would be brutal. And I think with the win streak that they've been on, I, I, just, I don't think that's going to happen. Again, as of this recording, they're at six games. So they would kind of have to, in these last like you know week and a half, two weeks, they'd have to go into a little bit of a tailspin. Uh, it just doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, something I meant to say about Daniel Gafford is it's almost like what what you've always wanted to see from Dwight Powell, and Dwight Powell is a Motown Noah All Star. I think he has the most Motown Noah All Star selections of anybody in the NBA ever. So he's I'm in his camp, like I'm a Dwight Powell girly. But I think what you get out of Gafford, and honestly, what you get out of Lively is what you always wanted out of Dwight Powell, especially with his frame. But now you just get it out of two dudes instead of one, and Dwight Powell can just wear his cute little goggles on the bench. I love it. Bench mob. Dwight Powell. Here for it. Another team that I've enjoyed watching this year. Never in a million years would I uh, uh, I have thought that this would be the case. The Minnesota Timberwolves. Cannot believe it. Not even sick to my stomach. Can't believe it. Excited, honestly, because my cat agenda was finally right. Until he decided that he wanted to put up 60 and then didn't want to do anything else and was like, I'm only here to score today. And then that game was against Charlotte, right? Brutal team to lose against. It's one thing to put up 60 on Charlotte. It's like, wow, cool. You know, it's Charlotte. A team that is so content with losing that everybody in the organization is like, these kids are losers. (laughs) Like, these kids are, are way too complacent with losing. They lost to that. But otherwise, my agenda has been proven correct, and and I'm wishing Carl Anthony Towns a speedy recovery. Hopefully, you know what they should do? Here's what they should do. 
They should fly Carl Anthony Towns to Germany and hook him up with whatever Operation Paperclip bullshit scientist they gave Kobe for, was it his knee or his Achilles? And they just injected him with some shit, and then like six weeks later, Kobe was like, I'm straight up, I'm back. Do that, Carl Anthony Towns. Just go to Germany and just and just do that. Just get on a plane and say Operation Paperclip, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Other than that, I mean, hey, Rudy Gobert just shut down Jokic the other day. I should say a, uh, and the Nuggets in general, a Jamal Murray-less Denver Nuggets. And I've been the one who's kind of been a little bit of a hater in the sense of, you know, if you get a Minnesota-Denver matchup in the playoffs, I really don't think, I don't care if it was a tough series last year for Denver despite them winning. And then after the series, they were like, that was probably the hardest series that we've had to play. You know, they, they have all the right guys to throw at them. I mean, you have, how many top to bottom, you think Rudy Gobert, you think Jaden McDaniels, you think Mike Connolly, you think Nas Reed, like dog, they defend. This is what they're built to do. And they can throw a lot of shit at you. They really can. Not a victory lap podcast, but coming out of LSU, I was a Nas Reed guy. And I rem- I might have written an article about him coming to Detroit. I don't remember. I think maybe it was like a mock draft or something that I had done. Those are the best. Here's my advice to anybody who is, uh, you know, trying to crack the industry, crack the rotation of the industry, and they're writing for some local blogs or something like that. Mock drafts. Those are... SEO farms, everybody will click on them. And the more detailed it is, it might not actually work to your benefit. Sometimes it's better to just like put the name. Most people don't even read the reviews, honestly. My problem with the dog, I'm I'm reading a mock draft the other day. And the dude that they had going in the top five, they're like player comp, Kirk Heinrich. Jesus, Jesus, Kirk Heinrich. And the t- Kirk Heinrich was a fucking sniper. We talk about Dwight Powell and his cute little goggles. Kirk Heinrich was like the pioneer of cute little goggles, okay? Sniper. It is no disrespect to Kirk Heinrich, but you got me fucked up if you think I'm drafting him in the top five, huh? It is nice for once to see, you know, a mock draft like be fucking for real because Kirk Heinrich, they could have easily have said Clay Thompson. You know what I mean? In the in the in the way that we uh you know sort of do these mock drafts, it would have been just as easy for them to have said, you know, him or JJ Redick or something like that. But instead, they said Kirk Heinrich. Washed, cooked. I'm just so out on anything that's a because I'm also confused, and this does not count as a tangent, by the way, because it is related to what we're talking about, not a tangent. They had Buzelis in this damn mock draft going eleventh. Huh? This is what I'm trying to communicate to you guys. This is what I'm trying to tell you if you have not started your pre-draft work yet, okay? Nobody knows in a way that they usually know a little bit. Nobody fucking knows anything about these guys this year. Not in the sense that, like, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know where they're going. Dog, you could look at five mock drafts right now. Buzelis would be going top five in three of them. And then I'm looking at one, he's going 11th. And then like two weeks ago, I saw he's going 13th. What's going on? Where are these kids going? I digress. I say all that just to say, that Nas Reed, he's pretty good, huh? Sixth man of the year? I don't think Malik Monk getting hurt, which by the way, holy smokes for Sacramento, you lose Herter and Malik Monk within like a 24 to 48 hour span. You lose Herter indefinitely, he's just done for the year. If you want Malik Monk back, you have to make it to, like, the Western Conference Finals. Jeez, bro. For a team that, you know, people already kind of weren't that high on this year, the West just is what— I think if if Sacramento was in the East, you know, could they make it to the Eastern Conference Finals? No, probably not. But they would win a series. I I don't know if they're going to win a series, especially now with no Herder and no Malik Monk, two guys that have been instrumental— in the success that they have had this season. So that's brutal. Does it open the door for Nas Reed to win sixth man of the year? No. No. Because that's not how it works. That's not how that works. Unless, whoa. Let's look this up on the fly. Does Malik Monk, does this injury, will it put him under the 65-game requirement? Because if it does... 
then as we know, with the new rule, he would not be able to. So he's played. Oh, he's played in 72 games already. Holy smokes. Has he just not missed a game this year? Dog, he's played 72 games. Malik Monk has played in all of the game. He met the requirement a week and a half ago. He met it two weeks ago. I didn't know he was that durable. I didn't. He played 77 games last year. All right. I'm sorry, Malik Monk. I, with all due respect, he is going to win six man of the year. But that is not to say that Nas Reed shouldn't be up there because there was a game that they played. It, it might have been against Denver. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I got to tell you guys, watching that Minnesota-Denver game. So uh, was it Jokic? Jokic uh, is in the low post against Gobert. And he kind of, it was an inadvertent elbow, but he does throw an elbow into Rudy Gobert's ribs. And he flails back and he falls to the ground. And I'm watching the Nuggets broadcast and they're yapping about like, talking about like, oh, Rudy Gobert is bitch made. Like it's the NBA. Like that's a flop. Like that's a flop. Rudy Gobert is like walking around trying to pull his jersey. Not trying. He's just like flashing everybody in the arena because he's got a bunch of tape on his ribs I think it's um not fractured ribs he had like strained ribs what in the Marilyn Manson fuck have you been doing strained your ribs huh but he's trying to show everybody and so when you have that context it where the elbow hit was literally on this where whatever you know wherever the injury is on his ribs so it makes sense and his face as it was happening in slow motion you can see he's hurt these nuggets announcers are just being fucking annoying Team wins one championship, and they're, they're just calling everybody bitch made. Annoying. Annoying. And then what did Rudy Gobert do for the rest of the game? Wah, wah. Record scratch, freeze frame. You're probably wondering how Jokic got here. They lost. They lost, thanks to how good Rudy Gobert has been. And that's the story. Uh, we can talk about Anthony Edwards being a, a potential future face of the league. You know, we can talk about the longevity of Mike Connolly. We can talk about this sort of... Uh, this this validation that I feel with Carl Anthony Towns, you know, really kind of proving some people wrong this year and changing the way that he plays on an almost fundamental level. You know, we can talk about Nas Reed being a, a, a potential sixth man of the year. We can talk about Jaden McDaniels being a, a perimeter defender nightmare. But Rudy Gobert, son, we've been telegraphing this one, been trying to put a stealth word out there, telling you guys every now and then. Now keep an eye on this Rudy Gobert stuff. You guys seeing this? You guys hearing about this? People start, people are starting to like Rudy Gobert in a way that they have never liked him before, ever. Point blank period, ever. It was four years ago, just over four years ago, that he's touching all these microphones and blah, 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 which can we be honest about something is so funny in retrospect. Now that we are sort of out of the pandemic, <laughs> COVID is over party, you know? It's like, we all got vaxxed, you know? It's like, all right, we're all back to doing whatever. That is so damn funny. It's also revisionist as fuck to be mad at him about that because at the time, nobody really knew. From like January, maybe like December-ish to early March, we were all just like, so it's the flu? Like, what is it? It's like, it's very funny to me in retrospect that the that the rhetoric at the time was like, oh, well, it only kills old people. So who everybody's like, oh, well, whatever. Huh? <laughs> I have old people that I care about. Him. I don't want them to die from this thing. Huh? That's not all that it is. Like, what do you mean? Rudy Gobert touches a bunch of microphones and then like three days later is, is, is patient zero in the NBA. Oh, okay. And so we go from that and, you know, just the, the many years of the uh, tumultuous basketball that was being played in in utah even when they were winning 50 some odd games people just hated the guy they didn't want to root for him for defensive player of the year they didn't want to root for him period nobody wanted to pay him that much money but then he goes to minnesota and does a money sign at scott foster and like is tearing down the gambling infrastructure from within he's like a sleeper agent for not for FanDuel, but i guess for the people he's basically like robin hood He's like, he's like the, so, so Rudy Gobert is basically like the Trojan horse, but who's inside of him? Pause. <laughs> Let's move on. Another team that I've really liked watching this year, and I'm shocked. Shit. I'm devastated. The New York Knicks. Can't believe it. I don't have as much to say about them as I have with, with Dallas and Minnesota, because it really is just out of some sort of, almost just sheer admiration. 
of Jalen Brunson. Oh my God. I've recently been going back and watching some like rookie year Luka highlights for no reason at all. And you know, the early years he's in Dallas and you just see Jalen Brunson running around. You're like, oh my God, I somehow already forgot, even though we've talked religiously on this show about when Jalen Brunson was in Dallas. You just forget that that was a thing. But now they have Kyrie, and you look at you look at how long Dallas. Not that I immediately segue to the Knicks, and then I go back to Dallas. You look at how long Dallas just had a bullshit roster that you you really tried to convince yourself that it was like, oh no, they got some you know they got some stuff, and now it's like on some nights, who's their worst player in the rotation on some nights? It's like. I don't, I don't, is it, is Maxi Kleba like the worst player on some nights? And I'm saying that in a good way, that if that's your worst player, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> that's fine. But okay, let's go back to the Knicks. Yeah, Jalen Brunson is just a, he's just a dog. He's a bulldog. It's what he is. Just had 61 against the Spurs. You talk about, mm, I gotta be consistent. And I didn't watch the Knicks game. I don't know what happened. I don't really know a ton of the context. I saw a few highlights here and there, but I don't I don't know if it was Jalen Brunson not playing defense in that game. I fucking doubt it a little bit, honestly. I made fun of Carl Anthony Towns for giving the Hornet 60, which, again, I still don't remember if it was actually the Hornets, but I'm almost positive it was. So I apologize if it wasn't, and this point doesn't matter. And then Brunson, who I also really like, gives the Spurs 60 and loses, and it's crickets from me. The coping hour will form a response and get back to you on this because I have nothing on it right now. I, I cannot I cannot defend myself at this time against these allegations. But I talk about Daniel Gafford getting traded to Dallas being just such a damn effective trade. OG Ananobi to the Knicks was really what swung the pendulum for me. It just felt like it was exactly what they needed. And even coming into the season, I'm like, if you're going to bring in Dante DiVincenzo, like, and you're going to, you know, I love Hartenstein. And the way that, like, DiVincenzo and Josh Hart and OG and Hartenstein will show up on some of these nights. Glaring omission of Julius Randle, by the way, will show up on some of these nights. They're just fun to root for. I don't love when Josh Hart plays, like, 40-plus. I just hate it. Because if I'm if I want somebody to play forty plus, I want it to be like, okay, this is about to be like a very guy who do you don't even care about basketball, you just care about entertainment. Yeah, I would rather see somebody cool play forty plus minutes, and I get that Josh Hart has to do it because of the way that he impacts a game and it it increases their chances of winning. I get it because he just does all the right stuff, uh, but it's like so he can play forty plus. But God forbid when like Joel Embiid is is knocking on the door of 80 or Luka knocking on the door. of Well, didn't Luka play big minutes in that game, actually? I'm saying all this just to say it's like when a star puts up 100 points in 13 minutes and then the coach is like, got to take him out. Can't keep chasing records. Oh, okay. Josh Hart over here playing 48 fucking minutes. All right, fine. And I love Josh Hart. And I love Josh Hart. He and Brunson just did a thing on Hot Ones, and it was incredible. It was very, very, very funny. Those two dudes are incredible. I don't really listen to their podcast that much, but I will say this Isaiah Hartenstein being like one one hundredth black story has has way more legs than I thought it was going to. I did. I thought it was going to be like after one day, people will be, wow, that's funny, and then they just stopped talking. People still talking. It's been like three or four days. People are still talking. I didn't think it was that interesting. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's inherently interesting. So I was like, oh wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. But then there's the the crowd of people out there who are like, he's not black, he's mixed. Just because you have a dad who's half black doesn't make you black. And I was like, wait, uh, so he's mixed. And then I was like, is that not? You know who's been really quiet? Nope, that's an intrusive thought. That's ooh, that's an intrusive thought. That's an intrusive thought, and I'm because it was about Israel and Palestine and the Black Hebrew Israelites. So we're gonna move on. Let's move on. <laughs> maybe maybe it's important that I finish that thought because it maybe it could have devolved and and it sounded like I was gonna say something that I was not going to say. All I was going to say was that it sounds like it feels like they would have had a lot to say about what's going on in Gaza. We haven't heard a ton from them. Maybe it's just because they're not, like, marching. Why were they? What was their deal? Why were they 
outside of Barclays Center, like protesting the Nets. Or so, oh, oh, it was it was exactly what I was talking about earlier with like Kyrie posting shit on IG. Didn't he post? It was like a quote or something from a documentary, and in the documentary, it promoted like Holocaust denial themes or something. And then people were like, "No, you're misconstruing what Kyrie is saying." And then the Black Hebrew Israelites showed up and were like throwing books at people or some bullshit for like a week or I don't I don't it was too long ago I don't remember what happened with that but I derailed myself I didn't get to finish the point about the Knicks that I wanted to make all I was going to say was I don't I don't think a a lot of us are thinking that New York is going to make this like extravagant finals run but there's certainly a path for them to get it to get to the conference finals right that that infrastructure exists but what you're going to need if you're New York is I don't think you can get it from Brunson for four straight games, and I don't think you can get it out of them for, you know, seven games. It's it's going to be contingent on whether or not Julius Randle is asleep at the wheel in the playoffs because that's what they're going to need. You know, they they have the role players around them. It's just going to be they, they just need that strong number two to do his fucking job, and I'm just a little... Because when it works for him... I mean, at its lowest with Julius Randle, it's like jab, 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 17-foot pull-up, brick. And if that's the, you know, if that's the iteration that we're getting, I don't I don't know. So I'm, I want it to happen for them, but what sucks is if it's going to happen for them, then somebody's going to have to go through Milwaukee, and I would rather that not be the Knicks. So let's do an email, copinghoursubs at gmail.com, spelled out phonetically. The email will be available in the description of wherever you listen to this show. If you want to send something in, have it read on the air. This email comes into us from Ryan. Ryan, welcome to the show. Subject line, bad vibes, starting five. Greetings from Dallas. Ooh, Dallas, you probably loved the front nine of this episode. Had a lot of love for your boys down there. Back to the email. I can't remember what episode it was, but I know you have mentioned previously that if you were to make a bad vibe starting five, Jimmy Butler would be a no-brainer. As an avid coper, I feel like I would have remembered you completing this starting five at some point, so would you care to give us an all-time bad vibe starting five? To clarify, for the copers at home, wow, he's giving you guys some instructions. I love this, Ryan. To clarify, for the copers at home, this should not include players who have been proven criminals. Slash awful guys like Carl Malone, Miles Bridges, Kevin Porter Jr., etc. This is a list of guys whose vibes are just off and generally unappealing. Much love, Ryan. This is an important distinction that it would be super. It's a low hanging fruit to throw those guys. Oh, Josh Primo is your point guard. I gotta tell you, man. I gotta tell you, and I apologize if I've told this story on the show before. I think I have. I think I have. I'm going to give you the super condensed version. You want to talk about, I love talking about players that I was right about or or players that I was wrong about and shit like that. The Josh Primo thing, I was like, he sucks. He's not good. He can't hoop. Like, he's bad. He's bad. I was like, I don't know if he's going to be in the league in three years. Well, (laughs) and then I ended up being right, but I I didn't telegraph it the way that I should have. I didn't call my shot. I didn't say... What I was saying was that he wasn't going to be in the league because he stinks. What I should have said was, I think this guy might expose himself to some Spurs staffers. Would have hit the nail right on the head. All time starting five, I'm going to punt on. We'll do that a different day. Let's do, let's try to rattle off some in the NBA today that I think have some bad vibes. Ryan, I hope that's okay if I pivot a little bit and just and just stick to current NBA because if I had to, because that's kind of how I've been prepping this one in my head, I must have just missed the all-time thing. We're going to start with Jimmy, a positionless all-time, I'm sorry, a positionless bad vibe starting five. We're going to start with Jimmy Butler. I think a venture capitalist, I think the epitome of like alpha culture, even if it's a bit, I hate it. Well, it's not though. It's not. With him, it's just not. The funniest thing, like, to say something nice about him before I keep being mean, the funniest thing about him is the media day shit. How he'll, the last two years, he'll just he'll just make sure that his media day photo is as stupid as it can possibly be. So that way, for the entirety of the season, anytime, or in like 2K, anytime that somebody wants to use a photo of Jimmy Butler, he looks uh, ridiculous. That's funny. That's a good bit. But otherwise, yeah, this whole mentality of, like, I'm just inherently better 
is annoying. Selling $25 cups of coffee is annoying to me. Even if it's to millionaires, it's annoying. I don't know. I feel like I've just done this spiel too many times and I'm kind of bored of doing it. I just don't like him. I just don't like him at all. <laughs> like, there's not an NBA player ever that I, like, actually real life don't like. Because usually I'm just like, it's basketball. It's whatever. Like, as a dude, they're probably a solid dude. I don't believe he's a good guy. I, like, I don't believe he's a solid dude. I, I don't. I don't. And what sucks is every time for the last three or four years that March and April roll around or, hell, May and June, if you're Jimmy Butler, he's lights out. And you have to reconcile with that And as somebody who doesn't like him. And you have to have an honest conversation. You have to look in the mirror and be like, is it me? Is it me? Because for the first six months of the season, he's a top 25 player in the NBA. He's a top 20 player in the NBA. You make him play basketball April through June, he's top seven. Huh? It's fucking annoying. <laughs> it's infuriating. And I think it might be the first instance of a player who is really embraced. Not I'm not saying he doesn't care about the regular season, but he does not play the same in the regular season as he does in the playoffs. And I think he's the he's kind of the first player that we're starting to see truly embrace pioneering this whole like I'll turn it on in the playoffs. I don't give a shit about the first 82. All that matters is that we end up in the playoffs or the play in. Right. And then we'll just like accidentally our way into making a finals run. Okay, cool. Good for Jimmy. Cool. Who else do I want to put on here? I don't think you guys are going to like this. I don't think you guys are going to like this. Paulo Boncaro? Mmm. Mmm. Kind of bad vibes. Kind of bad vibes. Not a huge fan. It's not like an arrogance thing. I just think he... I don't know how to describe it. Because he's good. He's good. And I remember when he jumped... Who was supposed to go number one that year? And then at the 11th hour, they were like, no, it's actually going to be Paul. It was like two years ago, so it's embarrassing that I can't remember this. But I was like, hell no. Hell no. The guy who has to wear like six different jerseys in a single college basketball game because he sweats too much? It's not a it's not an intended stray at people who sweat too much. Hey, we've all been there, right? Just don't like him. It's something about him, and I don't know what it is. But if you watch him in these pressers, he's just an asshole. <laughs> he's just not very... I could look at a lot of dudes on the Magic, honestly, like... Cole Anthony, I don't, I don't know. I guess Joe Ingles, why people think he's a sweetheart? Because well, I don't know. He is, he's funny, he's funny, but he's an asshole. Anthony Black, dweeb, like I don't know. Look, a lot of these guys. Jonathan Isaac, that's a good one. There's, you know what? If I could, if I have to pick one person on the Magic, <laughs> if I can only pick one person on the Magic, I'm gonna go with Jonathan Isaac. Who's another one? Like, I, I would love to throw Austin Reeves on here. He's a nice guy. Unfortunately, he's a nice guy. Ben Simmons. How do you guys feel about that one? You guys want to throw Ben Simmons on here? Is there a... if? Can I take an honest look in the mirror? Go down the... Ooh, ooh. If I, yeah, here we go. Uh, for the Pistons, I'm trying to think, like, if I had to pick someone on the Pistons, who would I do? See, is what sucks, Ryan, is I'm just not... It's not that I'm not taking your email seriously, but I'm, I'm more or less just kind of going down these rosters on the fly and being like, this guy's vibes, they are not good. It maybe would be better if I just had a, if I really spent like an hour and threw together a more concise list, sort of just throwing together a bunch of honorable mentions. Buddy Bayheim. If I had to pick someone from Detroit, Nepo baby. It's pretty much all I need to say. Malachi Flynn, don't love him. Evan Fournier, that's a good one. Bad vibes. Just kind of perpetually has a, has had a hard time since he's left Orlando kind of finding his rhythm and sort of carving out a, a legitimate role. I mean, he's been on the move, what, twice, so it's not necessarily his fault. He's playing for a bad team. James Wiseman, there's another good one. Horrible vibes. You know who does not have bad vibes? Like Taj Gibson, amazing vibes. People are going to say, Nick, it maybe a glaring omission of Isaiah Stewart there. Why? What has he done? What did Isaiah Stewart do wrong? Did I miss something? Did I miss a fucking headline? Did I miss a 4chan conspiracy theory? He's a sweetheart. He hasn't done anything wrong in his fucking life. 
Maybe you need to look in the mirror if you think something's wrong with Isaiah Stewart. Like, and if you threw a Grady Dick, do I want to throw him on here just through virtue of his name? I don't know. You look at the you look at the the the, the Raptors, Jonte Porter. We did say no criminals. Are does was is are these allegations regarding betting irregularities surrounding Jonte Porter? Does it constitute criminality or criminal behavior? Because I think we kind of have to put a pin in that one. I could easily pick his brother. Could easily pick Michael Porter Jr. There you go, Nick. Pick someone from a good team for once. All these low. Although I said some from the Magic, and they're like just an inherently good team. Who's coaching this team? Monty Williams, probably. Like all time bet. Well, that's what sucks about him is he's a good dude. He's a good dude. So maybe that's what I should do is I should pick a coach who is bad and his it, Steve Clifford. Steve Clifford seems like a dick. Maybe him. Quinn Snyder's always kind of seemed a little weaselly to me. I think he's somewhere between... He's had good seasons as a coach. But it's something about him. His hair is always kind of... It's almost always a little too perfect. Bothers me. Not in like the Chuck Daly way where it's just... It's it's almost... It's it's refined like it was made in a factory. In the most... In the best way possible. Something about Quinn Snyder. Eh. Eh. You go down the list in Houston, I mean, just going to move on to a different team here. Here's my thing. I didn't finish this on Buddy Bayheim. Why? Why is he still here? And you're going to, like, I don't know what it is. Oh, fuck. Right, right. Okay, so the reason that Buddy Bayheim is in Detroit is because one of the first, I think, scouting jobs that Troy Weaver ever had was with Syracuse I believe and at the time that would have meant that Jim Beheim would have been the coach obviously he's a coach for fucking 40 years and then just I guess through virtue of that Jim Beheim is at a lot of Pistons games actually he was at the one that I went to uh in December against Brooklyn he was there he was sitting like three rows in front of us I was like holy shit wow that's Jim Beheim that's like an all-time like actually though like an all-time basketball coach so that was actually kind of cool are we are we putting Grayson Allen on there or has he kind of gotten over that has he like made enough threes in his career and has kind of stuck around long enough that you almost don't even associate him with Duke anymore but I, but it but it's through virtue of that and through virtue of like his shenanigans and horse shittery that you is it is it never forget with Grayson Allen or have we forgotten I'll leave that one up to you guys we'll put a pin in it we'll leave him as like a reserve Drew Eubanks Drew Eubanks. Drew Eubanks is on there. He's a liar. Um, yeah, he's a liar. That's all. He's a liar. So Drew Eubanks is definitely on there. Draymond feels like a really low-hanging fruit as well. What do you want me to do? Dog, this, you guys see this clip of him? He tried to kick Grant Williams in the nuts. I don't know how it didn't connect. It would it must have been like millimeters away. There was definitely some grazing that happened. If it connected, Draymond's out two weeks. It was bad. It was bad. And finally, to wrap this thing up, Ryan, I've given you about 15 names here. But I stuck to the damn email, by the way. Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole. The worst, the worst, the worst loser in basketball right now. And, by the way, I don't know if you guys saw this, and I don't know if you guys heard about this. Did you see that loser Super Bowl that happened on Friday? Old Pistons versus Wizards in D.C. You see who came out on top in that one? Try as the Pistons liked to lose that game up by like 15 in the second quarter. And the Wizards outscored us by like 13 or 14 in the third quarter. Really tried to come back. They really tried, but they stink. They stink too. I don't give a damn if they have if they still have one more win than us. I don't give a damn if all that did was tie the season series at two to two. At this point, it's like don't be that team who loses a season series to the Washington Wizards. Honestly, the funniest part about that game is how much it sucked. For even the even when the Pistons are going up fifteen, 
God damn, that was a grueling 48 minutes to sit through for either team. Holy smokes. I, I cared that we won, and I cared that we were winning for most of it. But unless you're – and I – and let me look this up, actually, because Denny Avdia, for like 45 minutes – in real time, they were like, Denny Avdia, one assist away from a triple-double. I don't even know if he ended up getting it. Dog, he didn't. 18, 11, and 9 from Denny Avdia on 43% from the field, 33% uh, from three. I've kind of been mean to him. I've kind of been mean to him. and for, for Well, I think it's for shit that's been rooted in reality. But since the All-Star break, Denny's been good. Denny has been great. And he like has added a gear to him like i don't know how to articulate this he's just faster like he's playing faster when like he'll bring the ball up the floor sometimes and he'll he like he really gets moving like he'll do some shit he'll set like a flare screen or a highway screen or something and he'll just dart to the basket you're like huh you're like denny avdi has got wheels when the fuck did this happen so good for him i've been mean to him but i i i don't like him yet but he's he doesn't stink Denny Avdia does not stink. And the Wizards had like eight chances to make it a legitimate game, and they just couldn't. Drew Gooden as a broadcaster. Mm. I'm blanking on who the, the guy who does play-by-play -play for the Wizards. He's good, and I like him. Drew Gooden is a... He, he's somewhere between being too much of a homer to where it's like annoying. Like, the two worst color commentators in basketball for like the local broadcast scal in boston and stacy king in chicago holy shit please shut up please i'm begging you stop talking hire somebody else they're the worst drew gooden is not on their level he just cares very deeply about the team and that's not something i can fault him for it's just sometimes when i'm a fan of the team that they're playing against and he just like says random shit that isn't even true I get a little bit annoyed, but it's just for the love of the game. It's Drew Gooden. Not quite an NBA legend, but a guy who was in the league and I, I respected while he was playing. Wasn't he on the – Was he was on the LeBron 2007 team, right, that went to the finals against the Spurs when it was like nobody on the team. It was like Eric Snow. Was Shannon Brown there yet? Vera Zhao, Ilgauskas. Drew Gooden was on one of those teams. I, was, he, was he there? So I don't have beef with him, but he's somewhere between, oh, my God, shut up, and, like, this guy's funny. So I don't know. That is the all-time bad vibes starting five, ladies and gentlemen. There was also some people. We did, the like, the dream blunt rotation on Friday for NBA players. Uh, some I want to highlight, I guess, some comments that you guys left. Uh, leaving Bill Walton off the list. I would agree with you was a misfire by me. Leaving Brandon Ingram off the list, misfire by me. That one's a fucking layup. Brandon Ingram, are you I'm, I, he's got to be one of those players who when you hear these stories and these statistics about like how many players play while high, like Brandon Ingram just has to be one of them, right? Bill Walton surely was one of them. Bill Walton doesn't do anything anymore without being like zonked out of his mind. You listen to him and Dave Pash do a broadcast. I don't know how he hasn't fucking killed Bill Walton yet. <laughs> he will talk about anything. It's worse than me. Like, he'll talk about anything. He'll talk about anything. Nightmare blunt rotation in the NBA. This is impromptu. I didn't even really put any thought into this. I just figured, well, I guess it kind of makes sense to do this on the, on the tail end of it. I don't know. A lot of the guys I just named, honestly, I don't want to smoke weed with Jordan Poole. What is he going to do? Like, call me a pussy and then I have to fight him? Ooh. Oh, hey, I screenshotted something that I wanted to I wanted to read to you guys cuz I I never I never went back to this. So this was an article from country1025.com. 6% of Americans think that they could beat up a grizzly bear. You seen this? You heard about this? I'm only bringing this up because I don't know if it's I don't know if it's me or if it's you guys. Truly. One of us is dumb as hell. The amount of you guys... Like, nobody agreed with me when the when somebody emailed in like a week or two ago and they were like, Hey, 
Silverback Gorilla versus a Grizzly Bear, who's winning? And I was like, I'm picking the Gorilla 100 times out of 100. No one agreed with me. Nobody. All of you were like, you are stupid as fuck. The Grizzly Bear would kick the shit out of the Gorilla. One of us is dumb here. Here's my question to you guys. Here's my question. What happens when the gorilla gets behind the bear? What happens? What, is the, what does the bear do? Because I know what the gorilla does. He launches himself onto the damn bear with his thumbs and his shoulders and shit and his arms, and he just starts feeding them. He starts feeding the bear from behind, the back of his damn head, paralyzes his ass. That's what he does. You know what he does? Puts his shit in a chokehold. That's what he does. You know what happens when a bear gets behind a gorilla? He, oh, I don't think he can quite do a damn backflip. I'm telling you guys, man, go to the zoo. Seriously. Go outside. Go outside, first of all. Get in a car. Go to the zoo. Make sure they have a, a, a gorilla enclosure. And watch those fuckers, man. They're probably just going to be chilling, eating some stuff. If you live in Chicago, dog, the zoo is free. The Lincoln Park Zoo is free. You just walk in. That's it. They got gorillas for days in there. Please go. Because I'm telling you, I'm not saying it's chalk that the gorilla is winning. It is not lost on me, the strength of a grizzly bear, okay? I'm not disrespecting anybody here. But it's the... It's the it's the inverse of that is how sure that you guys are that the damn grizzly bear would win. I don't give a fuck how much it weighs. Ooh, but they could you know how fast they can run? And then I cited a video where it's like this dude was like on a on a biking trail in the woods and he's like got a GoPro on and he like turns around and there's a bear that's charging him and he gets a and one of you guys told me that that video is fake. That's really interesting to me. That's really interesting to me because you know who doesn't need videos faked on their behalf to prove how scary they are a motherfucking gorilla that's who so i beg of you i implore you delve into the stats a little bit on this you're not touching a gorilla i don't care if you're a three-ton grizzly bear okay coming out of hibernation Oh, man, all sleepy, and then bam, from the sky, a gorilla. No, we'll give the grizzly bear as much time as he needs to train. We'll put him in the ring with, in the octagon with whoever he needs, okay? But what happens when the gorilla gets behind the bear? I don't think a, gr a grizzly bear can really, what's their turn radius? Can they really turn on a dime like that? Because if the gorilla starts going, if he starts moving laterally, it's a wrap, man. Oh, is, it, is the grizzly bear going to stand up? What does that... Bam! Right in the gut. Like, what are you talking about? Who cares? You know, a grizzly bear, when he stands up, he'll be eight and a half feet tall. I don't give a fuck. Haymaker! Bam! Feed him right in the chin. He's asleep. He's snoring. Send his ass back into hibernation. I'm telling you guys. At the risk of sounding like I'm calling you guys stupid as fuck, you're stupid as fuck. <laughs> Come on. Think... Not to sound like R. Kelly, but use your common sense. Please, I'm begging you. The gorilla's gonna win. Have you seen... I've never seen a grizzly bear use sign language. Never seen... And what does that have to do with fighting? I don't know. It's their capacity to learn shit. What does a grizzly bear know how to do? Um, A grizzly bear knows how to detect a food resource and then they know that that's where food comes from and then they keep going back to that you know what's food to a grizzly bear a gorilla wait wait hold on what's food to a grizzly bear oh shit i fucked that up i meant to say what's food to a gorilla a grizzly bear a damn grizzly bear Guys, you you telling me, here's the thing, here's the thing. Well, no, I can't use that as a point. Just to be fair, I'll still say the point, but this isn't a good point. I was going to say, there's a reason they killed Harambe. It's because they were like, this thing might rip this kid apart. <laughs> might rip this kid apart. I was going to say, well, they wouldn't do that if it was a grizzly bear. They would have done it 15 minutes earlier <laughs> if a kid fell into a grizzly bear enclosure. Because at least a gorilla has the capacity to, like, process... Like, oh, this is a nice person. 
This nice this kid seems really chill. You got any shit to trade with me, little man? Or like, what well, a grizzly bear would just be like, ah, I'm a grizzly bear. Like this is biology. I'm gonna eat you. But the but the gorilla has the capacity for empathy, and for critical thinking. Right? This is this is primal shit. This is food chain shit. That a grizzly bear. All they know is like kill, 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 and you're gonna say that that works in their. F- I mean, hey, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that much about the psychology of what bears are like. But at least with a gorilla, you can you can train them. <laughs> Get in a defensive position, Harambe, Harambe Junior, please. Fuck. The first like live event that the coping hour ever does. Live from the Argonne Ballroom in Edgewater, Chicago, Illinois. A grizzly bear versus a silverback gorilla. MC'd by Motown Noah. <laughs> let's move on. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, because I, I should have just wrapped up the show. I don't know why. I was like, let's move on. I have shit else to talk about. I'm going to release this a day early. You guys are going to get a Sunday episode. Yeah. So that way there's nothing on April Fool's. Your April Fool's prank is that there's no episode on Monday and it's actually on Sunday. Pranked. Gotcha. Is this been in 60 frames this whole time? Has this looked, because there's been, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning. There's like a blue hue to this. I think maybe in post I'll cr- try to correct it a little bit because it's kind of pissing me off a little bit. Uh, I tell you what, dude. So uh, remember how I was telling you guys that playing 2K and, and playing Madden has been really annoying for like the last eight months because I have really bad stick drift on my PS5 controller and I just haven't been able to fix it. And I'm just not going to do surgery on the thing, right? So we bought, look at this piece of shit, Logitech. It's, I mean, it was like 15 bucks, but it feels horrible. It feels like a GameCube controller, but you know what, man? It doesn't have stick drift and it works perfectly. So now I'm in, man, I'm in my player. I'm throwing together like Hezzy tween fucking between the legs over the fucking shoulder I got Luke on my team. I'm a I'm a center. I'm a big man. Hey, when you guys when you guys um this and this question goes out to the um un the the unmelanated uh men and women of this podcast or of this uh show. I don't like calling this a podcast for some reason. When you guys make a player in 2K, you do my player. Do you make guy who looks like you or are you for real (laughs) because i do a little bit of both and the guy that i'm making right now i like made it so he's basically a descendant of wilt chamberlain that's like the lore that i made up in my head but then i messed up on his name his last name is scarborough why the fuck would it so i had i don't know why i did that because i picked a name that I knew the game would actually say, because I hate when they're like, ooh, MP with the, shut up, like, corny 2K, stupid nicknames. That's the, man, but if they've done anything right, if 2K has done anything right, and it's certainly not the size of the damn file of the game, 160 gigabytes for 2K24, huh? And I know that probably 140 of those gigs come from the city or the park or whatever the fuck. Dog, I don't play that. I'm not there to do that. And half of the shit that's there, I feel like nobody even uses. What are we, 160 gigs for 2K? Starfield isn't even that big. Isn't that bigger than Red Dead? Huh? Bizarre. But if any, if, if they've done anything right with that game, it's that in my career, there are no storylines. Finally, I can just hoop. <laughs> I'm not here to, like, do some, like, rap shit on the side and then, like, what was the what was the kid's name from like it was like 2K like 17 or something like that um it's Vic uh Basquiat's wasn't that him and then you just like in the late stages of the season and you just get this cut scene and you're like yeah your best friend just fucking died in a car accident <laughs> okay I don't I hated that guy that's fine and but your but your character's like fuck no Basquiat's he's my best friend and I'm just like, we got the Celtics on deck, bro. Like, get it together. Who, this guy was annoying. Like, who cares? They don't do that shit anymore. Thank God. Okay. Well, 
um, I think I held true mostly on the tangents thing. A handful of intrusive thoughts here and there. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening to this on Apple Pod, it's not on Apple Podcasts, Freudian Slip. If you're listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. If you're listening to this on YouTube, be sure to leave a like. Nice little comment for the algorithm. Subscribe, and I will catch you guys. Now In the next control. Beautiful, beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful.